This week's lab is called Identification of Unknown Solids. It begins on page 27 in your lab report. The purpose of our experiment this week is to identify, on the basis of their chemical or physical properties, some solid ionic compounds that we commonly call salts. Any time that we have a positive ion hooking to a negative ion, we commonly refer to those as salts, positive and negative. Some metallic positive ion with some non-metallic negative ion, and we crisscross charges and just write out what's called a salt, metal to non-metal. Um, every time I hear salt, we often think of sodium chloride, which is table salt, but we know there are a wide variety of salts. Any ionic compound is commonly called a salt. We're going to come into the lab this week and there'll be 26 different stations set up around the room, so the girls have been very busy setting up each station. So 26 unknowns. When you arrive there, there'll be a jar labeled um, of an unknown solid with two possible identities right on the label. Is the salt this compound or this compound? So two possible choices are going to be provided for you. The solid in the unknown is pure form. It's not a blend of those two things. It's one or the other. Your job is to conduct a small scale experiment that you design in order to determine the correct identity of the compound in the jar. So you'll simply cycle around the lab visiting each lab station, going in any old order, um, just easing congestion as you move around the room, and then to simply conduct a little test to identify each unknown. Your grade will be based on the accuracy looking to properly identify the 26 stations of the unknown solids. So to best help prepare you, I've actually created the filled in lab report sheet ahead of time for you. So this is actually a link on your Blackboard site as well. If you would like to print those off and begin kind of deciding what might be a good chemical test, um, so the link will be a copy of page 29 and what it actually is is um, page 29 done twice because there's only 13 blanks on page 29 and we have um, 26 stations set up so you needed two sheets. So I'd recommend definitely print out, just go ahead and print those as a link from your Blackboard site and that way you'll have that all pre-filled in for you, a little less tedious once you arrive to the lab. So 26 stations, you'll be conducting a small scale experiment using spot plates. So reaction wells is another term for those spot plates. And what they'll do is just allow you to create a very small scale experiment. You're simply going to wet the end of a stirring rod and dip it inside the jar of the solid sample. So a moist, moistened stirring rod will just allow a tiny bit of the sample to adhere. And you'll take that small quantity of that chemical and put it into a little bit of water inside of a reaction well. So just kind of thinking along the side of a reaction well, there's this little um, little plates or, or something you'll just carry with you as you move from station to station and each one of those wells you can conduct a little mini experiment inside. And so really there's no need to clean your well as you move from station to station until all the wells are full, but you should have plenty of room to visit all 26 stations. So you'll be given one spot plate and carry it with you as you move. Again, you'll just take an unknown jar. So let's say I arrive and the jar has a code A1 for instance. A1, you'll see um, it has two possible choices. You'll see on the label NaCl or NaNO3. NaCl or NaNO3. So those, you know, if you're looking ahead and have printed your lab report sheet, go ahead and print that. You'll see the very first station is labeled A1, and the label will have two choices, sodium chloride or sodium nitrate. Again, I'm just going to take a glass stirring, uh, stirring rod and just dip it in a beaker of water that's at the station to moisten it. And I'll simply insert it there to get a little bit of chemical. And inside the reaction well, I have placed a little bit of water in there. And again, I'm going to have a water jar, um, very similar before, so like a squirt bottle of water. And you can fill that reaction well with water there very easily. Very controlled way of, of adding water. And then I'll just take that little bit of salt and I'll create a solution inside the reaction well. So we can create microscopic amounts or just um, small scale amounts of solution using this particular method. Now again, we're going to talk about what test might I want to run 
to decide if it's sodium chloride or sodium nitrate. And let's talk about that a little bit further. Some of these strategies that you'll want to consider as you're trying to identify some unknown salts. Number one, water solubility. Is one compound soluble in water and the other not? So that solubility table that we were provided in our test taking tool packet, but you know what, I put on some uh, additional solubility tables in this link as well. So right in this lab folder you'll find some other useful tools that I would recommend printing and bringing with, with you as well. So again, some printable versions of the solubility table are also links uh, in this particular lab folder. Alrighty, so for instance, the solubility table, are they both water soluble? And if one isn't and one is, it's very easy to decide. Take a little bit of your unknown salt, dissolve it in water, and see if it goes or not. What happens if both of the compounds are soluble in water? So water solubility test didn't work. Here's the next thing I would consider. Do they have different anions or different cations? And I kind of think of that in that jar labeled A1 that we just said, we had sodium chloride versus sodium nitrate. Right, those were the two salts. Do you notice in this particular station, station one, they have the same first name. They have different last names, same first names. So obviously what will distinguish these two salts from one another is the last name. I'm going to try to exploit some sort of solubility rule that could highlight a chloride from a nitrate. Because sodium is identical, it's not going to be useful in, a, in determining the identity. But since they have different last names, that's the target that I want to exploit to determine the identity of the unknown. So think about just finding a reagent that will selectively precipitate one ion over the other. And when I say selectively precipitate, I'm trying to find something on the solubility table that pulls out nitrate or pulls out chloride but leaves the other in water. A selective precipitation. And you'll do the same thing. You're going to dissolve both solids and it's just one solid because it's in one unknown jar, but you'll dissolve a little bit of it in uh, water in your spot plate and observe. Um, add a reagent to selectively precipitate. A reagent is the testing chemical. What you are going to add to your unknown so that you can determine its identity. So a reagent is the testing chemical, something you are adding to your unknown with the goal in this particular test to cause precipitation. If neither ion is common, now what I mean here is, let's say I have an unknown where I have two different first names and two different last names. Um, again, consider selective precipitation, um, but also consider um, in if the positive ion actually is a, a colored transition metal, you can exploit that very quickly um, because those transition metals tend to be colored in solutions where at, you know, for copper or iron or cobalt or nickel, how those are colored in solutions, whereas the first and second family metals tend to be just white compounds. And so when they're dissolved, uh, they just become colorless, like sodium chloride or calcium chloride. When they dissolve in water, they become colorless solutions. So think about coloring uh, just as a quick identity base as well. And, I, and I'll highlight this real quick and I'll put it up again, but those colored solutions are part of your test taking packet or, or an, a link here in your blackboard as well. Um, iron, when it's dissolved, it's a transition in metal and it comes out a little yellow. Chromium has a bluish tinge to it. Nickel is green, cobalt pink. Manganese is also a little bit paler pink, but it looks pink in solution. Copper is blue. See how these certain transition metals have a distinguishing color. All right, so yes, you can print this table as well. It's a link in your Blackboard. Here's yet another solubility table. I put a link in your Blackboard. What I like about this one is it adds a little bit more information. Not only do we have, is it soluble in water, but is it soluble in an acid insoluble in water? So I can see that perhaps like aluminum hydroxide with capital A is not soluble in water, but is soluble in a strong acid. And I might be able to use that to distinguish between unknowns. If I see I, it simply means not soluble in water or acid. 
Alrighty. And then D would actually be destructive. It decomposes in water, so it wouldn't be a wise idea to use that test at all. So I like this particular solubility table. Again, print it because it's going to tell me right off the bat if it's soluble. If it's insoluble as a product, that's what the P is standing for. So calcium carbonate is insoluble as a product of a selective precipitation. And then the A, I can get it to dissolve in an acid. And then the I, not acid nor water. Alrighty. And if I quickly revisit this solubility table, I had it up just a moment ago. The reason I'm including this one is, suppose it's not soluble in water, it's not soluble in acid, I go to this particular test next. Um, that didn't come out very neat, sorry. Acid. So not soluble in water, not soluble in acid. This is where I go to next. Is it soluble in a strong base? And the reason I say that is some of these um, unknowns will actually selectively precipitate with a strong base, such as sodium hydroxide or an ammonia. What I mean by that is if I add, for instance, a nickel ion to a strong ammonia solution, it's going to precipitate. If I add the chromium ion to a strong sodium hydroxide, it's going to precipitate. So this far column, these complexes are called complex ions, but they are like an insoluble product as a precipitate. So I like having that test ready as well. Alrighty. So we have a solubility table in which we can see if something is dissolved in water. We have a solubility table available for water and acids. And we have a solubility table available for water, acids, and strong bases. So I provided all three of these for you just so that you have a variety of um, test taking, or I should just call them lab uh, aids, um, solubility tables to help us distinguish between those ions. You have a different look also, probably one that closely resembles this one in your test taking packet. And certainly bring that along. The more resources you use to distinguish your ions, the better off you and your lab partner will be. So these compounds, um, just generally soluble in water. Nitrates, always soluble. Acetates, always soluble. Chlorides, they're usually solid, usually soluble, unless it's silver, mercury, or lead. Now I just gave away station A1. Station A1, if you remember, we had two choices. We had NaCl or we had NaNO3. Station A1 had this or this. Those were your two choices uh, found on the label. They're both white salts, so the, the colored solution will, will not be made because sodium is a first family metal. It's not colored. But I just realized if nitrates are always soluble and chlorides are usually soluble unless silver, mercury, or lead happens to be its first name, what I'm going to try to do is selectively precipitate the sodium chloride. If it's indeed sodium chloride, I can select a reagent that would precipitate out the chloride, and it would not precipitate if it were indeed a nitrate. Something like, and it wouldn't matter, we, for a last name, we just want it to be able to be soluble. Um, it could be something like lead, any last name, let's say lead um, acetate, because it's always soluble, lead nitrate, it's always soluble. Um, something along those lines. So lead or ion, it's a plus two, that's not very neat. I'm having trouble with my pen. Lead ion or a silver ion, if I could introduce that into solution, I'd pull out the chloride if it were present, but I would not pull out the nitrate if it were present. Right? So that's what the idea is in this experiment. I want to be able to selectively precipitate one ion at a time. Test one. Are they both soluble in water, yes or no? Because that's a quick, easy test. If one is soluble and the other is not water soluble, I don't need a reagent. I'll just dissolve in water. Test number two, what if they're both soluble, but I'm looking at selective precipitation or perhaps even a, an observation of a colored solution if it's a positive transition metal that carries a color? And test number three, We'll go over that one a little bit more thoroughly. Test number three says if neither compound is soluble in water, check to see if it's a strong acid. And then if neither acid works, check to see for strong base. 
So using your solubility table, you see that carbonates, phosphates, chromates, hydroxides, oxides are all insoluble in water, but they're soluble in acid. So just to help see what we just said, carbonates, phosphates, here's our carbonates. Carbonates are insoluble in water, and yet some of them can actually dissolve in an acid. Phosphates are generally insoluble in water, but I can get some of them to dissolve in acids. Okay, so that's all that that little line is really saying. So if I wanted to distinguish between um, certain types of phosphates or certain types of carbonates, water wouldn't work for me, but acid sure would, and I'd be able to uh, determine the identity of the unknown with an acid test. Suppose, just back to that original slide here again that says, um, down here in the third test. If this doesn't help distinguish, then I go to the base. So that's kind of how I start. I go, okay, would a water test work? Would precipitation work? Then I decide if none of those are, are helping me, can I dissolve one in acid and leave the other one out? And if that one fails me, the default there by choice is number four. We're going to use a strong base, either ammonia or some sort of sodium hydroxide, and we can get a selective precipitation out there. And that's this particular that's this particular um, chart again. So again, I, I would be able to precipitate out selectively with strong base certain ions that are not soluble in acid or not soluble in water. Alrighty. So at this point, let's practice some together. The advanced study assignment. And we're going to be filling in page 31 together and just talk about what would be some possible tests that we could use to distinguish one ion or one salt over the other. The letter A, the first chemical test that has us deciding between sodium carbonate and sodium chloride. Na2CO3 is sodium carbonate, NaCl uh, sodium chloride. Right away we know that they have the same first name, so the chemical test cannot exploit the difference in first name, but it can exploit the difference in last name. So I want to decide how could I determine if something is a carbonate versus a chloride. So I check my solubility tables, chlorides and carbonates, and I realize that sodium, if the first name is a sodium ion, they're always soluble, aren't they? It's just sodium all the way across, always, always, always soluble. So they're both water soluble. Again, those are always first names or, or uh, any type of alkali metal are always soluble. So we're going to think selective precipitation. What could I add to sodium carbonate or sodium chloride that would distinguish it and compare the solubilities? We're going to try to find some first name that precipitates one over the other. So here's my solubility table, carbonates, and chlorides. Now carbonates happen to be mostly insoluble in water. I get lots of choices and see where chlorides are? Chlorides tend to be soluble unless it's silver, mercury, or lead. So I've got tons of choices. I could produce barium carbonate and barium chloride stays in solution. Barium would work. Um, iron 2. Iron 2 pulls out carbonate but leaves behind the chloride. Um, manganese too precipitates out. I mean, I've got tons of choices here. Potassium, both soluble, that wouldn't work. Silver, silver carbonate, silver chloride, that would not work because they're both insoluble. So we want to find a difference between the solubilities. Alrighty. And so what, I mean, lots of correct answers here. We just need to select one. I'm going to pick barium. Alrighty, just because that happened to be up top at the choice there. So what happens? I'll pick barium acetate. The barium acetate, barium with its plus two, and acetate is C2H3O2. I was almost just starting to write the word acetate there. I need to erase that. Uh oh. Let it catch up. I hope that it works. I'll pause, let the video stop, and then just create a new video when it's ready to start up again.